Today on the Basketball Manitoba podcast, we have Michelle Sung. Michelle is the head coach of the University of Manitoba Bison's Women Program, where she's entering her eighth year of service. She is a product of Millgrove, Ontario, where she attended St. Mary's High School. After that, she attended the University of Manitoba, where she played five years. During her time with the Bisons, she was an academic All-Canadian, was team captain, and finished her career fourth all-time in total assists in Bison history. Additionally, she received the Sylvia Sweeney Award, presented to a player who demonstrates outstanding achievement in basketball, academics, and community involvement. After finishing with the Bisons, she spent a year playing professionally in Belgrade, Serbia. She then pivoted to coaching as she was an assistant coach with the 17U Manitoba Provincial Team, was an assistant coach with Team Canada's Paralympic Basketball Team, a performance analyst with Team Canada's Development Team, and was also named to the U17 Women's National Team that represented Canada at the FIBA World Championships in 2016. Michelle, welcome to the podcast. It's always weird hearing your bio. You're like, I did all that. I know, <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. Exactly. And it's like, I was telling you like offline, I was like, hey, I'm going to read your entire bio, you know, on air and then introduce you. And I was saying that we, we, you know, before I just started the podcast and then after that, we would insert the bio after, but that's exactly the response you want to get is because I'm telling you all this stuff and you're like, oh yeah, okay, I did that. I did that. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's cool. That's cool. So it had, a, it had the proper effect. Perfect. <laughs> I always love the so, uh, played played professionally too. I'm like, oh, let's let, loose term, loose term. That requires a financial transaction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you you played for a club. We'll say that. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, this is actually a you know you probably don't know this, but this is a kind of a special moment for me in this podcast because this is you're actually the first person that I get to interview that's from my generation. Woo. So yeah, so for those who are listening, you know, Michelle and I played at U of M at the same time. Now I think our, we're not, not exactly the same age, but we played there during the same time. Everyone's been much older or way younger, and so uh, yeah. And 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 usually when I introduce um, the guest, I think back of a of a time like what what's my memory of this person, right? Because you know the community in, in Mantle was fairly small. Um, so typically you have a memory of someone, whether you interacted with them, you, they were a coach and, you know, you played against them, whatever it is. Um, I don't have one specific memory of you, but let's just say we know each other. <laughs> simple, <laughs> as simple as that. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, um, yeah, I think, I don't know if our years overlap the exact same, but I just remember you always being in the gym with that rebounding net thing <laughs> you loved that thing it was like every coach wanted to throw that thing out in the gym still does like no darcy uses it you can't throw that oh, out. oh <laughs> man because i used to just shoot all the time and because yeah. i don't know was, nowadays that was do you guys... pre, pre-shooting machine right exactly yeah. do you have you have yeah. them please tell me there's a machine oh, i know yeah. there's, there's a shooting machine i know that true. yeah i knew true. that yeah, yeah, yeah. and like i mean again okay I'm, we're not that old but you know, I, you know, I just like to say maybe the University of Manitoba was a little behind in the, on, in the equipment side at that point. Cause I knew other schools had them. We didn't. Yeah. Well, it was, <laughs> it was, it was weird. Cause like we were behind in the equipment, but I didn't realize until I kind of got on the coaching side that we're like, so lucky that athletes just can use the gym whenever, like a lot of yeah. share their, their gyms with rec use right during the day. Mm-hmm. Oh man, can you imagine if we had had a shooting machine? Oh my goodness. We wouldn't have been able to get out of the gym. <laughs> next, it would have been next level. Yeah, no, that gym was open all the time. All like the it, time. Was, it was crazy. Yeah. And even now, like I know, I mean, it, it was, it was, it would, it was booked, but in the day it was just open because yeah. the U of M had other gym space. Yeah. Like lots of other gym space. I mean, it's yeah. three, how many, there's three there's other gyms there? Yeah. And like courts. those other gyms now are really nice too. Right. So yeah. there's like rec rec, you know, the, the rec users would want to come over to our gym, but now it's those other gyms and in, in uh, the active loading center are so nice mm. that they mm-hmm. don't, they don't even know I get exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're like, don't tell them. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it is, it is a nice facility. Uh, the one thing I, I appreciated about that as a player um, is it is very, it was very peaceful. Like you could go there and no one was like, there might be other people like on the other courts shooting or something or volleyball, but like there was no like public there. It was very, yeah. very peaceful in that regard. I really, I really appreciated that. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah. It was fun. You can go in and like, you know, you could go in after like your Friday night games and like shoot around yeah. if you need to or Saturday. Yeah. yeah. Nice is it still like that? Can you still get in, get that type of access? 
Yeah, it's it's awesome. The athletes, like see, again, we're dating ourselves here, but the athletes <laughs> all have like card swipe access and they can get in. If facilities open, they can get into the gym. So it's pretty Oh sweet. wow, they got they yeah. got buzz like this the magic yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we you know, we kind of started at the end. I mean, this this podcast is about the story. And I always like to start at the beginning. You know, I kind of mentioned, you know, I said I don't have any specific memory of you, but you know. Again, we just know each other, but I want to ask you a sp- direct question is, you know, what are your first memories of, of basketball? Who introduced you to the game? Uh, when did you start playing? Yeah, it's, it's again, it's like retrospectively, it's so easy to answer these questions now, but I didn't realize at the time, like living in like just outside of Hamilton, Hamilton, Ontario was like the hotbed for women's basketball in the country. I, probably not anymore just because the game's grown so much in the country, but um, I just would go to camp and I happened to be within, you know, the catchment of the basketball school. And I didn't really realize it at the time, but then you start going to, you know, you go and do your in middle school tryouts and try out for a bunch of clubs. And then you just kind of, I'm like, Oh, every, Oh, all my friends play. This is awesome. And I just remember playing, um, at elementary school and like all my friends played. So it was just a natural progression. And then I just, I got the buzz when um, I would go to Transway camp, which is like probably, I mean, one of the oldest girls, only girl club in, in the country. And those camps were just awesome. They just had such great coaches. They had coaches that are still coaching too, which I don't think again is as common around the country. Um, yeah. And I just really got into it and I, I loved it. And just remember fall actually falling in love with the game in high school, just going in early and shooting. And again, a bunch of my friends were there. So it was awesome. I was a way to make some friends, but also kind of get into sports. So I got into it late though, I would say. Um, but yeah, I just, I just fell in love with, with shooting, like shooting on the driveway and then shooting in the gym and just learning new skills and watching on TV. Like obviously, unfortunately for me, there wasn't a ton of women's basketball on TV, but I do remember having like the Cheryl Swoops poster up in, in my in my bedroom. And <laughs> when when the Comets won, I think they won like three, the three Pete right at the beginning of the WNBA there. Yeah, um, yeah. Like those, those were up, but like definitely Steve Nash and watching those types of players, right? And you're just like, oh, there's like Canadians that are playing. So yeah, it was fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you said you, you start, you kind of, you, I guess, fell in love or got serious about it quite, quite a bit later. Was it in high school that you really, really got serious about it? Yeah. Like I tried out for the, for Transway probably like three or, three or four times, just didn't make it or made the B teams. Then kind of started to make, I made my first like a team uh, when I was young, like underage, cause it was the two age. So the grade nine, 10 club team. And that was when I was like, Oh, like, you know, uh, Richard nurse was my coach. And he, I remember so distinctly, he was like, look, you can be on this team, but you're like the 12th player. You're never going to play. I was like, no. he's like, go talk to your parents. See if you want to do it. I was like, I'm in. He's just like, do you know what? No, I'm in. And I was like, I, I just loved it. Like he just brought so much energy to the gym. And at the time that group was just such a close group of girls that it was like, Oh man, I get to play with them. This is so sweet. So I was like, that was when I like fully jumped in and I just, yeah, I fell in love with it. So yeah, nice, I, was, nice. I was a competitive dancer up until then. Oh, really? Then, so I was going to yeah. ask you, I'm like, did you play other sports or anything? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was a competitive dancer. And then um, like one of my, uh, um, a, a friend that I did a lot of um, like duet dancing with, she ended mm-hmm. up wanting to play volleyball. And so we both kind of had to make the decision in grade nine, like, hey, like, let's just part ways. So, yeah. So, <laughs> ended up, yeah. so you stopped. Yeah. That, that yeah. was the transition. So you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There so, you go. Yeah, mm-hmm. Well, yeah. so you, you had mentioned, uh, uh, I guess co- coach nurse or Richard nurse or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so you obviously have had, you know, I don't know if he was a, a specific mentor in your life, but you know, you, you we all have them, whether it be our parents, mm-hmm. coaches, friends, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, so who were some of those early mentors that kind of maybe kept you going or once you, once, once you started taking basketball seriously, uh, who were some of those, those mentors and kind of, I mean, th- th- what were some of the lessons they taught you? I mean, that, that, that question might be a little bit harder, but if there were someone who, who stood out to you, uh, who was it and, and, and kind of, what did they learn? What did you learn from them and how did they guide you? Yeah, it's again, I, I I'm at the point where I've coached stuff now that it's like two different kind of parties. Right. So in terms mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. playing, I had like really, really solid coaches, I think at every club level, um, like in high school. So I had Richard for, for two or three, three seasons, maybe. Um, and then I had Lisa Cinconi, who was like the person that 
uh, she had played uh, division one and she, she just saw the game from such a like technical standpoint. And I love that. Cause I just like loved watching sports. So she was kind of the one that sold me on like, Hey, you may not be the most skilled or the most athletic, but if you can be like the smartest on the basketball court, like you, you can play. And that was when I was like, Oh, sweet. Like there's an in for me. Right. Um, and then there was some good coaches at the transway camps, like Larry Angus, um, who uh, he was just always there and just, he sold us on like defense, but didn't really like, he just packaged it in a really fun way. And just like, you don't realize it. I, I obviously couldn't appreciate it until I was coaching. I was like, man, they were so good. <laughs> I got them <laughs> yeah. at such a young age. Like that was the thing. Like, I, don't, I still don't think we have a great um, grassroots um, continuum here. It's like, we had some of the best coaches coaching us in grade four. Whereas because maybe because we're just a smaller sport in, in Manitoba, it's just like, we still mm-hmm. have only the best coaches only coaching really at the end of like, you know, yeah. seven new university. So yeah, it's, it's it, interesting, but yeah, no, those are, those are some of the coaches and yeah, Richard nurse, just, he just, he sold me on like the energy piece and like just working hard. He brought like a different sport mentality. He's a football guy to the basketball, but it was just like high energy all the time. Didn't matter if it was like a September first practice after tryouts or like we were getting ready for provincials. It was like, you better be playing your best at all times. Yeah. 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 So, and then, yeah. And then I had, um, Richie Wazlowski in in high school and he was the first coach that I think it was just about basketball and it was, Mm -hmm like come in, do your job. You can go and have fun with the team. And it, it allowed me to like really understand that there is that separation where great teams are made by the players, like coaches impact it, but it's really carried by players that are, are really bought in and like truly look out for their teammates and, and that sort of stuff. So again, at the time, I didn't really think that was what I was learning, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Well- But it's cool, though, because like once you start coaching and then you can actually reflect back and you're like, oh, like you said, I didn't realize how good those coaches were until you started coaching. Then you're like, "Okay, I get it. Like you you really understand. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Someone's hungry. (laughs) <laughs> I, oh yeah, I, I hear, I hear, I hear, I hear something. <laughs> yeah, um, we, yeah like, I think the other thing too is I didn't have, like, I got a couple of female coaches growing up, um, but I never really thought of coaching as a profession. And I don't know if that was good or bad. Like it was good in the sense of it, it, it's like created my like give back mentality and mm-hmm. not everything's about like, getting paid and not everything's about expertise. It's just about getting anybody to like love the game for where they're at. Um, but at the same time, it, I think it also, it, it slowed my start a bit because I, I had never thought of it as like a job. Mm-hmm, it was just mm-hmm. going to be something that I was going to do because I wanted to give back because the coaches I had had were so good. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where, yeah, that's where um, Pam at U of M kind of came into it, where when I came back from playing, she was like, you're really good at this. And I was like, eh, I don't know. Like, I just like the game. Like, <laughs> I don't think so. And then I just kind of had people kind of like yeah yeah I think you could do this you do this and it's like then the wheel started turning but you know it's like a career you know you're Mm -hmm. building it in university or you're building it while you're training or you're building it yourself as an entrepreneur Mm -hmm. like I didn't really have that build up I was like had to do it when I started so yeah 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 Yeah, well yeah. is it what's interesting I mean in that kind of in that in that uh in that same vein like I was going to ask you you know down the line but we I mean you kind of brought it up now is how did you even get into coaching because you know you were playing. And then, like you said, you kind of started coaching. It was kind of like really quick. It's not like you planned and you started doing all this stuff. It's you're kind of thrust into it. Like, what was the story? How did you you start? Yeah, it's like, it's all timing. So when I came back from playing, it was like middle of the year and I wanted to try to go and finish my engineering degree at U of M. And um, I knew that I wasn't ready to give up the game like in, in its entirety, but I also knew I couldn't like coach a club team because in it, like head coach, just because those things take a little bit of time and organizational effort. And then, mm-hmm. so I, I assistant coached with Pam for one semester and then that, thanks buddy. And then you can, you can, yeah. And then uh, that summer, um, just, it, there was this, a situation where, where Pam just, she wasn't going to coach anymore. And when they were trying to find a coach, there really wasn't anyone interested Mm. And that's when I kind of got, uh, Colleen kind of, yeah, Colleen kind of 
uh, Dufresne, the athletic director at the time kind of sold mm-hmm. the idea of like maybe me coaching with Randy and just like learning on the fly. And if I was mm-hmm. interested and see if I wanted to do it, like, well, again, looking back on it, I think it was her way of like getting me into it. Cause I was yeah. not convinced that this was going to be my career and uh-huh. she's like, oh, yeah, you know, she like massaged it in and then, <laughs> and then yeah. I, and then she mentored me for that 17 U season Canada games. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the other piece was um, at the time, the Paralympic team was um, uh, centralized at U of M and they were going into um, it was pre Rio um, and they, yeah, or no post what was before it was pre London, pre London. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were kind of going into that. And, and I was just in the gym working with athletes and, and their coach was like, Hey, I have a couple of, athletes that want to do some shooting workouts would you mind just putting them through the same stuff you just did with university athletes at the time I was like uh I don't know anything about wheelchair he's like that's exactly why I want you to do it I was like okay cool yeah so yeah so my role with that was just like coach them like you know basketball and and it was just like I kind of became like a shooting coach in a way but I it was like that was the net like the, if you want to talk about being really into like the strategic level of basketball paralympic is just like whew, next level it's really? wild yeah well because the the biggest one is like the number system right like everyone's classified yeah. and you gotta yeah, have I heard about that right you gotta have your your lineups are are not just dictated by who's playing well who's tired it's like okay what are our combos what are matchups mm. how are they you know how are they neutralizing what we're good at? So yeah, the, again, that was a total time and place thing. I, I was just in the gym and randomly got pulled into it. And then it kind of grew, grew, grew. I really liked it. Um, and I was actually trying to pull it into um, my undergrad thesis with engineering. Cause I was in the biomedical engineering um, degree and I was going to do my undergrad thesis on like um, accelerometers on on wheelchairs at the time. Okay. And, yeah. 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 And I just didn't got into coaching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So don't recommend don't, quitting school, but <laughs> that's well, see, oh, I was going to, I was going to ask you like, so, because you were, you were doing your master's at the same time as you were coaching. Right. So you obviously chose the coaching and you didn't. So, so I guess for clarity, you did drop out. <laughs> I had already, I had already, I had already gotten my kin degree, so we already had a, a, a degree. Yeah, yeah. And I had, I didn't finish. I was like four courses shy of my engineering degree. Yeah. You know what? That's not. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. You're coaching now. Well, you, 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 know cho- what? you You have to show. There's a cost to everything. I, I might have that. to give you give my mom your phone number. You can tell her. <laughs> <laughs> Is she still hung that. up on that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like like all good moms. <laughs> yeah, you're so close. Just finish it. Exactly. Exactly. Mom, I'm coaching. Like I can finish that later. Don't worry yeah, about exactly. it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's interesting. So like when so like when you were going through that, your coaching and you're in school, was it the school just kept like taking less and less priority or did you make a decision at one point? Like, I just can't do this anymore. Yeah. Like I think again, not knowing what I was getting myself into the coaching side of it, there's just so many things that you need support on. And Mm -hmm. like, we don't have a full staff right in in Canadian sports. And it's, it's, again, it's definitely changing. Um, But at the time it was like solo. I was learning how to recruit. I was learning how to do scouts. I was learning how to do all of that on the fly. Um, and like Randy has a ton of experience, but at the same time, things change. Right. And he, I, he knew he was, you know, at the end of his career in terms of coaching at the university level, whereas I was just starting. So I think just, I got into it and I, I wanted to do a good job and, and I mean, we, we weren't very successful. So I think that gets addicting, right. You're just like, I want to do better. I know I can do better. And then you, you kind of just try, chip away at it. Right. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it's it's very similar to I mean, I think I don't know if I mentioned online or offline, but I was I interviewed Chair Jean Paul and and we and I asked her the same question because her path was was very different than yours. She was coaching at all these different levels for a long time, but I asked her the same thing, but kind of in reverse. I it was kind of like, well, well, at what point did you think about maybe not coaching anymore and just giving up and going down the other way because you know like you're not getting paid to do it full time. You might get a little bit of money here. I know she was at Red River. So yours is a, is a similar decision. At some point you have to make a decision. You can't coach. Like you only do that like part time and give a full effort for so long, right? You have to focus on it. Like you can't coach a, a, a program and just be like, I'm doing it part time because you're letting everybody down at the end of the day. Yeah. That and like, I think the, um, 
relying on volunteers, it, it's exhausting because it's not someone's job. And so you're relying on people to give up their free time that they're not getting paid for. And like, you can only go, you can only ask so much, right? Um, before, like, I mean, I mean, some people have no problem doing it. Um, but like, I just, I just, I took it so hard when it was like, okay, like, I know I need to do this, 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 and this, but like that person can't help me do it. And I'm already like, my time's already cut in half. So yeah, it just kind of became like, if, if I want to give it a good shot, I may not ever get an opportunity to coach at the university level if I don't take this one. Um, like it's not as, I think some people think it's, it's easy, right? Like you kind of just accumulate experiences and then you apply for that job and then you might get it, but yeah. there's just so many other things that go into it. And we don't have a ton of professional coaching jobs in Canada. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, I think, I think from that perspective, again, retroactively, it's like, okay, it was, I'm glad I took it when I did. Cause I don't know if I would have been able to get back in, but at the same time in an ideal world, it would have been awesome to, you know, get two or three years of full-time coaching, <laughs> coaching experience, no but kidding. Like, talk to a, talk to a Canadian coach at the university level right now that, that got that right. Yeah. Not, not a ton. Yeah. Not a ton. Right. True. So yeah. True. Yeah. Well, so some, one of the challenges of, of, being a, a university coach is, is recruiting. So I got to ask, I want to kind of go back and why'd you come to Manitoba as a player? Cause I mean, you're not from Manitoba. You now yeah. live in Manitoba. You're coaching the Bisons, you're on the modern. So what, what brought you here in the first place? Yeah. Like I, I was at, um, I, I was lucky enough to make parental team once and like being from Ontario, that's like a big deal. Um, if you're not like that solidified division one athlete, right. So mm -hmm. making that provincial team, I got a ton of late division one interest, but it wasn't anything that really got me excited about being able to like compete and like win, um, uh, academically, there was some great, there was some Ivy league school. And I think I, I went down that road for a short amount of time, which again, it, it allowed the door to open for more Canadian schools to kind of have a conversation with and yeah just kind of came down to um I guess my dad is really like a practical thinker and he was just like come up with your top three things and and if a school really stands out in them then it's it's easy you're not going to go wrong like every Canadian school has a decent education and most coaches and cities are like relative we know we know enough about them right we're not sending you off into nowhere right so yeah it just kind of came down to like but uh, it's funny. People ask me, well, why didn't you go to Mac? I'm like, I would have loved to go to Mac, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it was like, you know, you know, when the school that you want to go to maybe doesn't recruit you, but um, yeah, I just, I really wanted an opportunity to play. And um, when, when Pam came and recruited me, that was something that she was able to almost guarantee me because they were a really old team. Like they were graduating six players my like the year before I came in so I knew that I was going to get an opportunity to play and there was already like two one potentially all Canadian one two Canada West all-stars like so it was like oh this could be really fun like they're not at my position I could play mm -hmm. with them like yeah so it just it was a really good fit and then academically um I didn't know anything about U of M and now obviously being on the recruiting side, there's literally not a program that we have to turn a student athlete away from. Um, so it was an easy decision because I didn't know what I wanted to do academically. So yeah, that was kind of what sold me on it. And then going away, like, I think there is some, there is some pull for athletes that have really thought about, you know, well, I want to play division one, or I want to want to go away. I want that big, like, you know, the announcement or I'm going uh, for my parents to like be able to brag about it. But yeah, again, that wears off. Like I think now in the recruiting process from my end, it's like, okay, great. Like I I'm all for that excitement, but think about year two, three, four, five. Cause like that doesn't exist. That's not a thing, right? <laughs> There's no yeah, signing exactly. for you to come back to year two. Right. So yeah. 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 But yeah, no, it's yeah. interesting. I, I always like to ask that, you know, like how did, yeah. how did you come here? Why did you come here? And, and, yeah. uh, and, and it's interesting to see people who, I don't, okay. It probably doesn't happen more often than not because you only really think about the people who stayed, but, uh, it is interesting to hear the story of like, well, why, you know, why did they stay and, and make it a home or, you know, what did, what did they appreciate a lot about, you know, about the, the city or the, the, the place. And so, you know, in that same vein, you went away after you graduated, when you graduated, did you know that you were going to be staying in Winnipeg? Cause you went and played, you know, for a club and then you came back and did your master's was that kind of like you just did it because it felt right? This is the only place you've ever lived as an adult. Was it all those things? Was it were there other reasons? 
Yeah, I wish it was my master's, by the way. It was just my <laughs> second undergrad. Um, yeah, no, I tried to go home when I when I went overseas and played and come back. I was like, you know what, I, I want to I want to move back to Ontario because in a way I had I had kind of grown into being an adult in Winnipeg. Like I learned how to drive here. I got I had my first like full time job. I you know had I I bought a house here. Like there are things that I just experienced and I thought that I had had maxed out on it. And I went home and just like trying to reconnect with either high school friends or make new friends. Um, and then just the pace of life. Like it's interesting. I still fly into you know fly home or fly into Toronto and it's like instantly just like a different mindset and. I knew that I had, I had liked being away from it. I'm a little bit of an introvert. Um, like I liked being, you know, a slower pace when, you know, on the weekends and, and stuff like that. So it was like, I gave it a, a go for like a month and then it was like, no, I got to I have to go back. <laughs> You're like, so, I'm yeah, going back like, to Winnipeg. Yeah. And like, to, I mean, you know, like everyone is just so nice here in the sense yeah. of like, that was the biggest difference that surprised me was I had friends that weren't basketball players. I I had friends that were musicians. I had engineering friends. I had, you know, I I had friends that were in theater or dance, you know, like there was just, and I I don't think it's as common in larger populated areas because you're ending up, you spending more time with people you work with or you play with. So, yeah, yeah, it was just something that was really neat to me. And then uh, I, I, I may have been sold on that by uh, my now husband so <laughs> he did he did a good sell job um, <laughs> yeah, shout out to yeah, him. yeah so the guarantee was as long as I could go on a hot trip once a week once a year <laughs> I was like I will live in Winnipeg <laughs> uh, yeah it's you know I've Winnipeg is like it's 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 true you say all those things about it and um uh there's there's some very nice things about the city and the people and the community um you know it's like the the small big city you know what i mean like there's lots of people yeah. there but it's still you kind of feel like you have a, a smaller knit community so it's you know it is I, I don't know how unique it is but it's definitely unique in, in, in many different it's like ways. you're really similar to to hamilton like it's it's pretty really? similar. like like blue collar i think uh multicultural pockets like from either just like a work demographic or immigration like you know what i mean like there's just it's weirdly similar i think just the biggest difference is proximity to other cities right like in, in yeah. hamilton you can like drive yeah. nine hours and you're in new york city like yeah the closest we got is minneapolis so like that would be the only difference but yeah that was i think that was also something that made it a bit easy for me was it felt somewhat like home in that in that way and i have family like i had family here um they lived in thompson now they live in winnipeg so that also helped a bit too like i think if um if i didn't have family i, I may not have been as easily like, sold on it but yeah 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 that yeah makes sense so. so well we were talking a little bit offline about uh, the, the the p word <laughs> the pandemic <laughs> and I kind of asked you I said you know how did how did you know how has it been and and you're you kind of went into a little bit I want to kind of go into that a little bit more just being that um you know I think most people that don't coach um for a living have a very different perspective on like you know I mean I would say everyone has their own perspective on how they dealt with it but you know yeah. the challenges that you faced are, are kind of unique because it's like how do you recruit during a pandemic how do you train your athletes during a pandemic how do you stay in contact with them? What type of things are you like? There's so many things that like, that could have happened, probably did happen. I've talked to other uh, coaches in, in um, other provinces and stuff like that, um, where players, you know, they would just go like everyone just goes home. So if they're not from there, they would just go home. Whereas some provinces, uh, you know, you were allowed to have small groups play. So there, it's just everything was all over the place. Right. And so I'm curious, a few things, um, you know, how has your perspective changed um, with and even even now so like now things are kind of back to normal but like even when it comes to training or recruiting um obviously you've probably took some things for granted that you realize you're like oh wow like i would you know we didn't know how easy we had it um so just generally like you know what are you what are your what were some of the biggest challenges you faced and uh maybe some of the perspectives you kind of gained going through that as a university coach yeah i think i mean like everybody i think it had like those big ebb, ebb and flows right like it was it was we're doing a really good job right now or we're not, or, you know, you were second guessing or you, or you were really like excited about what you had decided to go with. Right. So I was fortunate that I was teaching university course at the time. So like, for me, I was forced to look at schedules and, you know, adjust what we were doing. And, and I think 
again, I feel like I've said retrospectively so many times today. Um, <laughs> it was, it was helpful because it, it, it made me like sit down and look at dates. Whereas we had just finished a season, um, with the basketball team and I literally flew home from nationals and we were in lockdown. So, um, being, having some time there was a really nice cushion. And then, and then you just found like, I found that that was how it ended up going the whole time. It was, we were one of the more stricter provinces in the sense of like full lockdown, everything was on zoom. Um, if you told me I would have done like almost, you know, a full year of zoom workouts, I would have been like, you're crazy. Cause I remember the first one, like I was doing the first zoom workout. And I'm just like, I did not sign up for being a fitness instructor, like, this is wild. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, it, it was just kind of like, there were so many like nights or, or days where I would just think, Hey, like, what do the athletes need? And I think to your point, like there was just so much variety. Like there were, there were the athletes that were away from home. There were athletes that had a ton of resources at home or space at home. There were some athletes that were living by themselves and just trying to meet each one individually where they're at was really important. And I think a lot of the times in the off season, we like, you know, blanket the whole team, um, in normal, in normal situations. And we just say, Hey, like whatever your context is here, are our expectations come back and make sure you meet them. Whereas I think it forced us to look at, can we get a little bit more individualized with it and actually ask the question, like, what are other constraints other than like, motivation to you not being able to complete an off season, like workout or, um, get excited about training or, you know what I mean? So those things were, were that, that was that first off season. And, you know, we, we played around with some, some ideas and we had some coaches call with our conferences. I mean, I like everyone else, I jumped on all of the virtual coaching clinics, but after a while, you kind of just had to shut out the noise, come up with a plan and try to do it. Right. And, and just see what the athletes, how the athletes responded. Um, th- I, f- I would say that was okay. The off seasons were okay. It was more the, the law, lo- the lost season. That was like super mm-hmm. tough. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're trying to come up with ways in the gym. It started with, you know, we had to be in two groups. They never were in the change room together. We had girls that literally played a year together and they didn't really know each other. Like, it's just a weird dynamic. So we're starting this season and we're like, Hey, like introduce yourself. Like, well, I know her. I'm like, do you know her? Like, you know, her square. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Like, you know what her living room background looks like, but yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So th- I would say that was more challenging was the, the season last year and, and just trying to see where everyone's motivation felt. Cause I, mm-hmm. I think girls that had had really good training habits before were starting to get like sick of it in a way. And ones that didn't have any training habits were like, Oh, this is great. I get a little pause. I can work on some stuff and yeah. I can learn all about nutrition and, and what, like, you know, what different names for workout workouts are and that sort of stuff. But again, like they're all human and they're going to have points where they're totally unmotivated and they're going to sit there and ask, you know, what's this for? Um, so yeah, it was, it was wild. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, there wild. you go. Like, it was wild. One word. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, do you I, think, I, so go ahead. no, I know like back to your original question in terms of biggest perspective learn. Um, I, I think it's not uh, underestimating like the, the power and influence like of, of mental health over athletes and how they come to practice. So like, whether that be how they present in terms of effort or, um, interest, like those things, I think we sometimes in season we, as coaches, we get a little bit, we take away the emotion of them as people and just blanket to them as like, well, you're not motivated. Like, let's get out of the gym. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like, no, like what's actually going on and digging in. And I think it allowed us to really, to understand each individual. And now when you go back in season, you're like, oh, okay. Like I know a little bit more about that person and we've gotten through some hard stuff. So this is, this is doable. Um, that was one recruiting was interesting because, uh, being honest, like I, I didn't, I was, I was very like scattered with it. Like I would go in ebbs and flows of motivate, not motivation, but, um, maybe time put in. Um, and it, I like literally just took the year and like systemized everything. So it's now just like, that here's the date, here's what we want to do. Here's conversations here. Here are some documents that, that can help us with different contexts. And then from there, it's like, it, it allowed me to take away some of the emotion of rejection. Cause essentially re- like recruiting is 90% rejection, right? Yeah. yeah. You're um, in sales. Yep. Let's be honest, yeah. You're in so, sales, you know. so, um, yeah. Or it's like speed dating all the time. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it really is like, it's, 
So it's, it, that, that's really helped me. It's like, I can sleep now when, you know, someone decides to go to a different yeah. school. And, <laughs> maybe it's not well, me, right? So, or, it's not, or school, it's like something else, right? But so. what, what is it like, again, is it at this point? I mean, obviously during the pandemic, it was all online, but now do you think that moving forward a lot more, of this is going to be done like the way it was during the pandemic? Do you see a lot of that sticking? Yeah, like I think one of the, for me, like I have a young family. I think the travel of pre-pandemic was getting me a little bit anxious about like, would I be able to like hold this standard? And now it's like, no, like I, I, I think it's, I've been, I have way more access to more kit, to more video. Mm-hmm. Um, I think using social media and just pre-conversations before talking to kids is like, it's a time saver now. Cause it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, I don't even have to get into a conversation because there's this glaring thing that doesn't really match what we're trying to do. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think I, I'm a little bit excited about it because it's reduced travel, I think. And yeah. I, from our, yeah. from our and men's side too, I think they're looking at it of like, can we save some money here and be for smarter? Sure. With, yeah. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And then, and you had mentioned kind of the mental health piece. Do you see that a lot of like, so for example, this off season, or even, even to this break now, maybe, I mean, it's a pretty short break, but let's say into the, this next coming off season, do you plan on maybe staying connected in a similar fashion one on, I don't know if you're doing one-on-one meetings or Zoom meetings with your with your players, but is that something if you were doing it, you want to continue? Yeah, like I, I think a big thing that changed for me was, I mean, men, mental health and like mental skills. Um, one, having it period periodized within our like seasonal plan, huge. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I think the analogy that I used with the athletes a ton was, here's the buffet, come to the table and take what you need. Um, so like there was opportunities to meet with us one-on-one, there was opportunities to meet with our, our sports psychs. There was just, uh, like life skill workshops or guest speakers that we brought in. And it was like, not everything is going to resound with everybody and not everyone is going to know where they're at. Cause I, I feel like that's the biggest challenge right now is that I think a lot of the, a lot of athletes now have awareness of different, different like points of mental health but sometimes they don't know either where they're at or mm-hmm. how to assess where to go with it. Right. So it's like, mm-hmm. I know I can't focus, but what do I do? So it's, it's more like, okay, hey, here's the buffet. What do you need from it? And then let's just follow up with a discussion on like, is there something that we're not offering or that you don't know um, how to get help with? And, and we can kind of facilitate it as opposed to like me trying to champion that as like an expertise, right. There's people yeah. that ask, yeah, that's what they do. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. No, that's great. So I want to kind of trans, uh, you know, transition from one challenge to, you know, a large challenge to a personal challenge. Um, you know, you're a mother, yeah. you're a coach. And so yeah. you, and I know at one point you were coaching, you're, 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 go, you're going through a pregnancy, like you're pregnant and then you're coaching. Yeah. And so it's, it's during your, your first uh, pregnancy, you coached during that pregnancy, correct? Yeah. I'm wrong. Like, yes. Okay. Yes. So yeah. that's a super unique challenge. I mean, it's not often that ever, not everybody gets to do that. So when you first were pregnant and then you're coaching again, same kind of questions with the pandemic, I guess, were there any perspectives gained? Like, I mean, it, it is a very unique thing. Not that I would imagine that there are other women, uh, female coaches who've done it, obviously, but you've never done it before. So do, a, does, do you have any mentors that kind of helped you along the way? Um, you know, being pregnant is physically and mentally exhausting. And then you're dealing with all these other things. So I guess it's generally like, I mean, what was it like? Uh, You know, what did you gain from it mentally? Do you even remember any of it? Yeah. Well, so yeah. So like, you think you talked about pandemic. So I'm a classic. I had a pandemic child. (laughs) So that was Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that was, that was almost more challenging to be honest with you. Um, Mm. But yeah, no, I think pre like, the only reason I knew I could do it was because of the staffs I was with, with Canada basketball, every staff had one or more either young coaches that had just had kids or older female coaches that had had kids and, and had made coaching a career. So when I remember it was like my first camp with development team and Michelle Belanger, um, older coach, but a long time UFT, I think she coached for like 40 years. Um, just like, an amazing person. Like I I didn't know her a ton at all. She had come out and played at our preseason tournament when I was a player. And that was really my only interaction with her. And then just like, it was like instantly day one roommates. And she, she just, yeah, she was really honest. Um, 
um, with any question that I asked. And she had the perspective of like, just treat it like any other job. Like it, women have worked and had kids in every profession and that's all it is. And don't let anyone tell you that you're crazy for doing it. Every job is crazy in its own right. So that was like very, there was like a, a couple of very impactful conversations with her. And then probably my biggest like mentor, if you want to say in terms of moms and coaching is, is probably um, Danny Everett, like Sinclair. Um, she was at UVic and now she's at uh, Carleton and like, yeah, she just three kids and it was no questions. And it was just, you know, status, not status quo, but like, this is normal. And this is what yep. we do. And, um, there are, there are unique challenges. Like one thing that I really took from her was she's really good at like, she was really good at insulating support around her. So like at different points in the season, she would have, you know, like her, her mom come in or, or have friends help or like have a nanny or like just things that, um, that d navigating a similar job. Cause you know, like I don't have very many, people even, I don't have a single person at UVM that has the same job I do. Right. Um, and, and, or I was the first coach on staff that a female coach on staff that I had kids. So, um, yeah, I think those, those were really good ones. And then she was really good about, you know, advocate for what you need, like tell your athletic director what you need and how they can support you. Cause I remember when I told our athletic director that I was pregnant, he was just like, Oh, okay. What do you need? Like he was, he was openly supportive, but like, yeah he was also really open about like, Hey, like this has never been done before. So let's figure it out. And, and let's yeah. uh, go from there. So yeah, that was, yeah, I, I, I had way more positive. I think any of the doubt that kind of built up in my own mind was, it was really easy to talk it out with a lot of people. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was good. And then, yeah, like I said, I think I, I think last year and having, I, I had planned to try to take a mat leave for second child and mm -hmm. um, just the way that that pandemic happened and, and with, my Eric, my husband being a high school teacher and then not being able to navigate whether or not he would be close because he was, you know, close contacts and all that course, stuff. And yeah, it just, it made way more sense for him to stay home and, and help me. Cause I was, you know, I was 50% at home, 50% on the court. So yeah, mm -hmm. it was, yeah, it was not as it planned, but nothing ever is. And yeah. we've dealt with it and um, yeah, it's awesome. It's, it's so much fun. And like you talk about perspective, um, I don't know if I would still be coaching if I hadn't had kids. Really? Like I, I would, I would be completely burnt out, like a hundred percent burnt out. Um, yeah, I still remember like when, uh, like game prep, practice prep, um, conversations in recruiting, like they're one and done. So like, I don't have time to come home and like get mad or dwell on practice because you know, we yeah. execute ball screens. It's like, well, we didn't do it great. Tomorrow's another day. I either have to teach you better. We need better effort from the athletes, but I have other stuff to do when I go home. Yeah. And it's funny because you're like, we tell that to the athletes all the time, right? Like leave it at the door. And as coaches, like we never do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. So that, that was a big one. And, and like the game prep too, it's like the ability to like get a scout and like set a timer, like two hours of prep today on this mm. team. That's it. Um, just like little things like that. Um, I don't lose sleep over losses anymore. Like I used to like not sleep after we'd lose and yeah. a lot of losing in my first couple of years. <laughs> uh, that was a lot of lost sleep. And now, now it's just like, no, there's it's yeah, it sucks. And there's always room to get better, uh -huh. but it's not life. Like I'm not my job. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 That's no, that's interesting. Yeah. Like it, it almost like you, it gave you you know, obviously a, a different perspective, but it allowed you to compartmentalize the basketball and then focus it. So you can be just as efficient, but like, you're not, you're not worrying about it all the time. And like, a lot of times we get caught in that, like you're thinking about things, you're not, you're not doing anything. It's not like you're being productive. You're just worrying about it. It's just yeah. stressing you out. Now you're like, I don't have time for that. So I'm going to put time for this and then I'm going to forget about it. Cause I'm doing this. I never thought about it that way. It's a, that's compartmentalizing is a good word. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think too, like, like any young professionals and I still do struggle with it. Like the whole imposter syndrome, like, like I really struggle with that. Cause it was like, do I deserve to be in this job? Do I not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the first couple of years. And then I think you get the same feeling as a parent, right? You're like, am I, am I going to do it? Like, is this, is this <laughs> yeah. and like, there's no choice. Yeah. There's no yeah. choice when you're a parent, right? Like you either, yeah. you figure it out and that's it. So yeah. it, it kind of helps you deal with those emotions too, right? Like you, there's just certain things you're like, why did I care so much what people thought before? Cause yeah. like so many people can care what, how, what I do as a parent, but like, Hey, it ain't changing unless you want to come over and my kids. Yeah, right? like, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, we're, we're getting, we're getting close to the end here. I have a couple more questions. Um, okay. So there's two, 
two, you can decide on the next question, which one you want to answer. So there's two of them. Um, and I'll, I'll just say them back to back and then you can take a moment and pause and think about what comes to mind. Okay. So question one is your most memorable basketball story. Okay. It can be of anything. It doesn't have to be like winning. It can be anything, just most memorable, like just most impactful. And then the second, the other second question is, is your funniest basketball story. And again, this can be on the court, off the court, whatever. So your choice, uh, maybe they're one and the same. I don't know. Uh, but oh, take a moment, <laughs> whatever comes to mind. Um, and it could be as a coach when you were playing, whatever. I think I'll do the, I'll do the memorable one and I'm going to, I'm going to do two, I'll do two quick ones just cause yeah. I can. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, when I played definitely it was, um, playoffs versus Regina at home and like pack gym and like just having that, that experience, um, both now, but also then it was just like, okay, this is really cool. And it allowed, I, I, it was my second year, I believe. So it just allowed me to put perspective on like, cool. Like I, I, it's so fun to play in that environment, but mm -hmm. it also didn't affect my enjoyment of the game. If that made sense. It was just like mm -hmm. a moment that I had where I was like, okay, like I, we can play in the most high pressure game, tons of fans, lots of excitement, a lot of people know what's going on, but I still would play the same if, you know, we were playing, you know, the first league game and, you know, we had mm -hmm. three fans mm -hmm. and that was really important for me. Cause I, I, I think, I think about that now when I go back to the same gym, I'm just like, okay, it, it, it's all about like the athletes and, and what we did this week. And um, yeah, the other stuff's great, but it, it also doesn't define your love for the game a little bit. I don't know if that's, mm -hmm. that makes, does it justice, but that was one. And then my, probably my, I have uh, my most memorable co coaching experience was when we won uh, FIBA Americas in, in Mexico. And there was just like so many, so many things that we had navigated really well as a staff. And um, I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to be on a staff like that again. So, and I know that now, but we just like, we, we like loved what we did um, both when we were coaching and when we were like, cause we, 16, you like you're, you're not chaperoning, but you can't just, you know, senior, senior team, you like, you can leave. Right. Yeah. We just, yeah, we, just we embraced the, as we had a staff that just embraced all aspects of it and we just enjoyed being around each other. So when we were prepping and we were game planning, um, it was awesome. And we were, when we were hanging out and we had like great, meaningful discussions and, and the group too, like, there was just like so many girls on that team that you're like, Oh, that's what like true leadership is. Or like, mm. like just, you know, telling a, a kid that they made Team Canada for the first time, like the, the, all those things just kind of played into, and then us being able to upset the U.S. was just like awesome, and it was it was mm -hmm. so much fun, and um, yeah, and like I, I just don't know if I'll ever get to do that again, and I I don't yeah. take it for granted. So, yeah, that was with uh, what? So that was with Carly Clark, and then Danny, um, Jody, um, Megan Pinsky, Michelle Bell, like like every staff member, like we're st we still kind of, you know, keep in touch with. So yeah, it was just, it was a fun, a fun experience. Yeah. Love yeah. It. Mm -hmm. And you, yeah. you got a funny one or no, just too memorable. <laughs> one of my funny ones. I don't know. Well, <laughs> it's, it's super. Okay. I've, I found it hilarious, but it was also like a very impactful moment for me. So we were, we were in weight training with Paralympic team and okay. like uh, co as coaches, you have to, you know, you help out. Right. Cause they need, I <laughs> mean, um, one thing you do learn instantly when you're with Paralympic sport is like the world is not accessible to everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. So workout spaces are not accessible to everybody. So we're down in the grotto. I don't remember this. We're down yeah. in the grotto and, uh, mode, one of the, uh, wheelchairs she's, um, she doesn't have use of her legs. So, you know, I'm helping her set up, I think it was bench press or whatever. And she rolls past like someone doing a chin up bar. And like, this guy's got like a massive, like upper body and like yeah. super skinny legs. And he like jumps down, like kind of turns around and she turns to him. She, she's like, bro, I have an excuse for leg day, but like, you oh. don't. <laughs> <laughs> wow. She was, she was just like, you gotta, you gotta incorporate leg day. And I was just like, <laughs> just like wow. up, called, called him out it was so good it was hilarious oh, wow right? that's yeah. awesome did he did he yeah. say anything or was just like uh, just who, was who, like, who the heck are you yeah 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 <laughs> so i think it was it was kind of neat though too because like i mean you know they were in their team canada gear so yeah there was like a lot of education that always went around right when when you're with that team in different spaces like i think it's just a great opportunity for really really great discussions right mm -hmm. so 
yeah, that would also be like one of my really good coaching memories was winning worlds in at home, like in Toronto in 2014. Like mm-hmm. again, that group of, of athletes and just everything that went into that season was just so cool. And again, I don't know if I'll ever be able to experience that. So yeah, it was neat. Well, it's interesting, you know, when you reflect back and in this conversation, I'm thinking you know, like, wow, you, so you started off as saying like, I didn't, it wasn't like, I thought I was going to coach. It wasn't like, it wasn't a plan of mine. And then you, you started off your coaching career essentially yeah. at the top I know, like on all levels. Like, oh yeah, yeah. I assist to a team. Guy. It was like, boom. And that is yeah. so unique. Like it's almost unheard of, but the, the, the interesting part about it is not, okay. It is interesting that you did start kind of at the top, but when you say you're like, you know, I wasn't even sure that I like, it wasn't like, it wasn't a deep seated desire. It wasn't like you were like working yeah. your butt off. And then all of a sudden they're like, you got all these opportunities. It was like, I don't know. I was kind of there and people just saw something in me. So, and that, that's, that is interesting because clearly like some people like, you know, Colleen, like she's amazing. And the fact that she was like, saw something in you to be like, Oh yeah, I you know. Like you could do this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's pretty, that's pretty special. Yeah. That like that Canada game staff. So like Colleen, Don Thompson, Randy Xano, yeah. myself, yeah. like, still when I see the three of them, like, again, it just like, they knew before I did like Randy too. Like Randy was like, Oh, you got it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't yeah. Know yeah. You, you didn't about. even like, believe in yourself. And they're like, no, 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 no. And like, yeah. you know? And so like, it, it's cool when I see them. Cause it just reminds me like, yeah, like maybe, maybe I needed those, those successes to kind of stay in it too. Right. Like maybe that's mm-hmm. the universe's way of like getting me in for 40 years here. Like I'll mm-hmm. always mm-hmm. coach for her, but, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, maybe that was just the way to get me in and, and key me. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's just interesting. It's just, a, yeah. I'm just thinking about it. I'm like, yeah, this is weird. Like that's, it's probably the least traveled road to, to being a collegiate coach ever. Like that's not the way it (laughs) goes, you know? I mean, okay. No, it's not true. Like, and you know, there's probably exceptions in the States, you know, someone, but those people play like pro and then they get an opportunity because they're like, Oh, they're a pro player, you know? And so very interesting. And it's funny. You mentioned, um, Randy, uh, Colleen and and Don. So I've interviewed Don, I've interviewed Colleen, um, and, uh, can't wait to interview Randy, of course, (laughs) um, uh, interviewed you as well. And I think it was Colleen mentioned offline she said you know what would be really cool um is if and and i think it's something that i hope you know adam you're listening right now uh that we get to do if there's a season two of this is bring on groups of people and kind of have reflections and um because colleen said that uh it was a special moment for her and don said the same thing and that this that your the staff was awesome like the the four you were unbelievable and you guys got along and it was just a great time and so i you know it'd be really cool to bring all of you on to kind of just reflect on that season and stuff so to to hear you're now saying the same thing that they're saying it was a very you know like it was was a special staff so yeah um, that's a great idea but like i think the other thing too to i maybe call it hopefully colleen um this came through but like like the, the impact that she's had in trying to get females into coaching mm-hmm. is like, mm-hmm. it's almost, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I think in the coach, she's like on par with, you know, like it was funny when all the idea barn stuff came out last year and within all like the Canadian coaching channels were like, we've had coaches been doing this for years. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. but it's just like, you know, media attention, but yeah, she was like, she's just been, it's almost like she's had this like vision mm-hmm. before anyone else could like get on board. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah no she was awesome i love her interview. Yeah. i think her interview is coming out uh again i'm not sure when yours is airing but i think hers comes out in like a week so it was awesome yeah. i loved love talking with her and, um okay but on that same note so now we're going to wrap it up last question um and i want to focus it on female coaches so you know what advice would you give some coaches you know young up and coming coaches even other coaches that you know have ambitions maybe they're high school coaches and they they want to you know rise up in the ranks and they, they, you know, they look at you and they say, Hey, you know, like they're listening to this right now. And they're like, wow. Okay. Well, like she had her own unique, you know, avenue of getting there. I'm doing this, but you obviously have some, I mean, you used it, the, the word a couple of times, you know, in retrospect. So you, you obviously are someone who thinks about, you know, where you are now and where it used to be. Um, not everyone does that. And so you obviously have that mind. So what advice could you pass on to some of those coaches that, you know, maybe, maybe they just want to be successful coaches. Maybe they are coaching community club and they're 18 years old. Maybe they're playing college basketball. I don't think it matters, but maybe a direct message to female coaches. Um, and uh, yeah, what, what would you tell them? If you could talk to every, every coach right now, that's, that's uh, sees you as, as a mentor, what, what would you tell them? What would be like the one message? I think the, it's like your, your path and what you think coaching will look like in your life doesn't have to be what someone else's looks like 
So it's like, you can make it, you know, you can make having a family work while you're coaching, or you can, you can put coaching on hold and you can come back to it. Like it, just because I coached while having kids doesn't mean everyone else does. But I think what's really powerful is, is having females coach because we want, you know, 50% of participants to be females. And if, if they're not seeing people that look like them and, and that are, you know, have different voices, then our ability to keep girls in sport is, is just, I think, cut in half, if anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big one. And, and not, I I feel like I, again, um, it's, you never know where your impact is going to be. So, you know, you, you may have a really tough year, you might be super busy and you might be only be able to put in, you know, half your effort because you have other stuff going on, but you still might by just being there and being a role model for like one person, you know, they may become a ref. They might, you know, get really interested in and work for a sporting organization. Like it all adds up and it makes a difference. And, um, I think it can look different every year. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, cause I know oh, there's a lot of jobs where, you know, it, it doesn't have to be. So I think that's one. Um, yeah, I think the, the other one is, is, is like not, is not being afraid to ask for help. Um, like I was really lucky that I had like the Don Brandies and, and Colleen's that gave it to me. Um, but I, I think now going back to when do I need help and what do I need help with and being really direct with those questions. And I think that that helps because it allows you to juggle everything a bit. Right. Um, yeah. And the last one is funny because, um, unfortunately we saw a really big drop off in coaches this year, right. In, in grassroots basketball, especially in Manitoba, but I think it's a pandemic thing. Again, I think there's studies coming out about this. Um, I found myself like trying to recruit people into coaching. And one of the things that Eric, my husband and I came up with was like, coach with your friends, coach with people you want to hang out with. Um, especially if you're not doing it for money, um, coach with people that, you know, you want to walk into a gym and spend an hour and a half with, because it makes a difference. Like you're enjoying what you do. Um, they see like, like, it, the sport creates friendship and bigger things, then it's just going to be contagious. So that's a big one for, for people trying to get into it. It's just like, enjoy, make sure you, you can find a way to enjoy your first couple of years. Cause, um, there's a lot of other things that take away from that sometimes. And you don't want that to be the focus. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a great way to wrap it up. Um, appreciate you taking the time. I know you had some, uh, early in the interview, we had some little ones creeping into the background and heard a little bit of that. So we were able to get through most of it. I thought I was going to get an appearance on camera, but, uh, oh, no, you know, I think... shout out to Eric. Eric is doing a good job. So <laughs> Eric's amazing uh, with Bryant, but I think Jojo has heard me talk on zoom more than any child. In okay, life. So, so she's just in bed. She just put herself to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is okay. Mom. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, on that note though, I do appreciate you taking the time and uh, good luck in the rest of the season. Thank um, you. I know you're enjoying a little bit of a break right now. Um, but uh, we'll get back to it. Hopefully everything is smooth sailing and, uh, um yeah thank you appreciate it thanks for having me it's great perfect okay take care thanks for listening to today's episode please like subscribe follow and share this series and reach out to us with your comments on the show thanks again for joining us